thank you very much. Put this up here so you can hear me. How's that sound, okay? Um, thank you for being here tonight. It's great to be down here in Independence. Um, I even got two of my, uh, my, my daughters to come with me on the promise that I would take them to Sonic afterwards, so uh, it didn't take much bribery, but uh, they wanted to come down and, and watch this event too. And I'm just so encouraged by people being here tonight. This isn't a political rally. This isn't a, um, <clears throat> it's certainly not a movie. It's certainly not a, a sporting event, but you know, when several hundred people show up uh, to learn about their rights and to learn about science and to uh, take part in one of the, probably the most pressing issue uh, that we've faced collectively. I mean, there was the Cold War and things like that. If you think about all, all the things that we have faced as Americans during our lifetime, this should have been an easy one. This should have been uh, a, a, a simply science uh, being presented to people openly, people making their own choices, people selecting from a variety of, of treatments and therapeutics and whatever else is on the marketplace. This should have been a no-brainer, but instead we find ourselves uh, with our constitutional rights uh, being infringed, we find ourselves with our livelihoods being infringed, and we find ourselves in a truly bizarre place for a supposedly free society, a constitutional republic, which is what we have. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about me uh, that uh, I guess wasn't in the bio is that before I became your Secretary of State, I taught constitutional law uh, for 15 years in Kansas City. And uh, while that I was a professor, I was also litigating constitutional cases uh, and preemption cases and, and all kinds of different sort of complex uh, civil litigation cases in the Third Circuit, Fifth Circuit, Eighth, Ninth, Tenth Circuits, um, and have you know, argued these issues as well as taught these issues. And so I'm going to be talking tonight a lot about our Constitution. I will do my best not to put you to sleep, but I am. I, I think you will want to hear this. You will want to know. Uh, what's happening with respect to our Constitution, what's happening with regard to our liberties and the, the powers that are being abused, uh, in particular by the federal government. But, but the, it is so important that we talk about this and that you know this, because at the end of the day, the Constitution is our best defense against vaccine mandates. And our founding fathers, uh, you know, I'm sure when they, they drafted these various provisions I'm going to be talking about, never envisioned that the tiny federal government they described in Article I primarily of the Constitution, that that tiny little federal government would ever be involved trying to force Americans to take a medical treatment uh, or a vaccine uh, at, upon pain of losing their job or on, on other pressures and coercive tools that the federal government would use. They would indeed be rolling over in their graves if they could see what they see today. They probably wouldn't be too impressed with our president either. Um, on, on September 9th, I'll, I'll try to keep it. You probably remember on September 9th, uh, Joe Bi President Joe Biden told us uh, that he's losing patience with uh, us unvaccinated people uh, and that it's, he's decided that because his patience has run out, He's going to take action. Well, Mr. President, I don't care if you're losing patients, losing your medical, uh, your mental capacity, or both. <laughs> Whatever you lose does not give you the right to take away our freedoms. Amen. And we are absolutely going to stand on our constitutional rights. Then, on that day, September 9th, he announced uh, the first of several executive orders, which is, of course, uh, ordering all federal employees. Uh, to be vaccinated, which is just appalling in my mind. I've litigated, I've represented in court ICE officers in the past, and I'm currently representing a group of ICE officers in a case down in Texas. Uh, the idea that we would force these men and women who are taking, their lives are at risk, they're taking great uh, risks on behalf of the country to protect the country, then that the federal government, their employer, would then force them to do things they don't want to do and should not do. Uh, is just appalling. And same with our members of our military. Uh, I'm sure many people in this room know either family members or friends who have been forced to take the jab uh, or lose their position in the military. Again, I think an unconscionable uh, act of, of coercion. So that was the first thing, federal employees. Then came federal contractors, another executive order. Every business that has a federal contract has to vaccinate their employees. What that has to do with fulfilling a federal contract, I don't know. Uh, but President Biden decided to use that authority as well. And then he announced, he said, and coming up will be the mandate from OSHA forcing all businesses with 100 or more employees to force their entire their workforce to be vaccinated. That affects, according to OSHA's calculation, 80 million 
of us. 80 million Americans uh, are, are faced with this OSHA mandate. Uh, by OSHA's own account, there are at least 23 million they think that they're going to coerce into getting vaccinated who have chosen freely not to get vaccinated thus far. Well, that mandate was, uh, issue, was finally issued on November 4th, even though Biden announced it on September 9th. It took him a little while. Um, and then five days later, on November 9th, uh, I filed a lawsuit on behalf of a group of North Dakota employers and North Dakota employees to stop the OSHA mandate. We filed that suit because, again, the federal government has no constitutional authority whatsoever to mandate vaccines. I thought I'd t begin by talking to you a little bit about the lawsuit and why I believe this lawsuit is going to win, along with a couple of other lawsuits that it's been consolidated with. But I think the, it'll, it'll illustrate a lot about your rights and about what's happening with our government. Um, one of our plaintiffs is a company called Dakota Travel Nursing Staffing. It's a company of about 500 employees, mostly nurses, who are paid by this central company, and then they go out and provide nursing services to health clinics, small hospitals, rural medical centers, all through the upper Midwest and the Dakotas and Minnesota. 40 to 50% of the nurses who work for Dakota Travel Nurses have chosen to become, not to become vaccinated. 40 to 50% based on their own medical observations and what they have seen in the field with respect to COVID and with respect to vaccinations. And the CEO of the company, she is also a nurse. She is unvaccinated and does not intend to become vaccinated because she has a very good health-based reason for not doing so. If the Biden OSHA mandate is enforced, that company is going to lose over $9 million a year. $9 million when they lose their employees and then lose their contracts and lose their business uh, that they would otherwise have. Um, and not only that, the nursing shortage, which is a nationwide problem, is gonna get even worse in the upper Midwest because all kinds of facilities will no longer have nurses able to be provided to them. Some of the really small facilities will have to shut down in rural areas. Some of the medium-sized facilities will be able to remain open, but they'll have fewer nurses. And so therefore they'll have fewer beds. And again, in theory, if we're supposed to be in the middle of a, a pandemic and a health crisis, why in the world is our government restricting the number of nurses and restricting the available uh, beds in hospitals? But of course, don't ask for logical answers. Okay, another. Uh, plaintiff is called Miller Insulation Company. They're based in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, they have 388 employees. They provide insulation to commercial facilities, to the oil fields, uh, and also to residential facilities. Um, they pulled their workforce and 67% is unvaccinated and does not want to become vaccinated. The CEO of the company has no intention of forcing his employees to become vaccinated and so he wants to fight this OSHA mandate. And again, they would lose uh, in excess of a million dollars a year if their employees had to leave uh, and the company were enforced, had to enforce this mandate. Okay, why are we gonna win this case? Why, why, am I, why am I confident about beating the OSHA mandate at least? But you'll find that there are some other areas I'm not so confident. Uh, first of all, it violates the commerce power. As you guys probably know, if you remember back to your high school civics, uh, back when high schools actually taught this stuff, and I'm sure here they still do. Uh, but the Constitution authority to regulate interstate commerce on an article in Section 8 is where almost all of Congress's powers are rooted, and the idea is that they're regulating interstate commerce. The only problem here is that there's no commerce when you or I choose not to purchase a vaccine. And these vaccines are purchases. They're being bought from the pharmaceutical companies. They're being bought by the federal government in a subsidized purchase. But if we choose not to engage in that commerce, there's no commerce that the federal government is regulating. And the Supreme Court has already ruled on this very question, not about vaccines, but with regard to health insurance, back in 2012. Remember the Obamacare case, NFIB versus Sebelius? Uh, in that case, the Supreme Court ruled that the commerce power does not, does not allow the federal government to force anyone to buy health insurance because that's not regulating commerce, that's forcing people to get into commerce when they choose not to. And I'm gonna read a quote from the opinion, the good part of the opinion, this is where the court said there was no federal authority, then they went on to say, and Justice Roberts joined with the more activist members of the court uh, and said, well, but we can call it a tax anyway. But the part that's relevant here is the commerce power, and I'm gonna quote from the opinion. Construing the Commerce Clause to, to permit Congress to regulate individuals precisely because they are doing nothing would open a vast and potentially a new and potentially vast domain to congressional authority. Every day, individuals do not do an infinite number of things. If the government could regulate us every time we choose not to do something and force us to do that thing, 
then Congress could, could regulate every single aspect of our lives. There would be no domain where the federal government could not go. And so we, if we choose not to purchase health insurance or choose not to get a vaccine, Congress has no authority under that power. And by extension, OSHA, which was created by Congress in 1970, OSHA has no authority to exercise that delegated power. So the second argument, that's the first argument. The second argument is it violates the employee's First Amendment rights. Now, we've, we've already heard a little bit about uh, religious exemptions, and millions of Americans have a perfectly valid faith-based reason uh, to refuse the vaccine. And a variety of faiths have expressed their religious free exercise in, in their choice not to get the vaccine. Now, you may have heard, however, that the OSHA rule, they tried to accommodate that, supposedly, by saying that employers can, if they wish, give their employees an out. And if they don't get the vaccine because they have a faith-based reason or some other reason, that's fine. They can get tested every single week and wear a mask every single minute of every single day in the workplace as part of the, part of the price of exercising that, that, that liberty. Well, that's not enough. The reason that's not enough to satisfy the First Amendment is that the costs fall on the employees. Um, insurance policies won't pay for an, a non-medically necessary uh, test. And so if a person's in that situation and they're getting tested every Monday for 52 weeks a year, the cheapest tests out there are 20 bucks a pop. That's $1,040 a year at the minimum. The average price, the, the median price of these tests is $148. That would be $7,600 a year. That's an effective tax on your right to exercise your religion. And I'm sorry, Mr. President, but in America, we don't pay a tax to exercise our liberties. These are God-given liberties. We can exercise them every day, whenever we want to, and we don't have to pay a fee to exercise those liberties.